Hello and welcome to the first highlight seminar of 2021 hosted by the Institute for Molecular Science and Engineering. I'm Leah Adamson and I am the IMSI Events Officer. Um, so today's highlight webinar will be on the theme of antimicrobial services via molecular engineering strategies for biomedical applications, the opportunities and the challenges. And it will be presented by Professor K. G. Nua. Um, I will put some helpful links into the chat function um, before the webinar begins. So these will um, include links to our Eventbrite page where you can find the registration for all of our upcoming IMSI webinars. The IMSI YouTube channel where all of our previous webinars are uploaded, including our webinar series on antimicrobial resistance. Our IMSI blog, the Never Lick the Spoon podcast, all of our previous briefing papers, registration to our newsletter so that you can keep up to date with all of our IMSI news and events, and also a link to um, the information for our IMSI MRIS scholarship. So just a few top tips to make sure that we can have a great webinar. Please make sure that your microphone and video are switched off during the webinar. Um, they should already be, but please do just double check. Um, if you wish to ask a question, please put your questions into the Q&A function at any point during the webinar. Um, your questions will be answered at the end. Um, please do not put questions into the chat function that, that pertain to the presentation. Um, this should be reserved for if you have any technical difficulties. Um, please just message IMSI Imperial privately and I will try and help you where possible. Um, so I will now hand over to Dr. Sia Matabeli, um, our Future Manufacturing Systems Challenge Champion, to be our presenter for today. Thank you very much. Thank you, and um, it is our great pleasure to welcome Professor K. G. Nio um, to our seminar here, uh, highlight seminar at IMSI. And uh, <clears throat> uh, so Professor K. G. Nio is a professor in the the Department of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering at the uh, National University of Singapore. She received her bachelor and science doctorate degrees in chemical engineering from MIT. And the main focus of her research is on molecular engineering of materials to control the interaction with biomolecules, microorganisms, and cells and the application of such technology to address biomedical issues and, um, and to prevent, uh, to help healthcare in preventing associated infectious diseases and, uh, and to target also theranostics. She has published more than 600 uh, papers, um, including also book chapters, and she has been granted uh, 26 patents. And uh, she has been the recipient of several honors and uh, awards from different uh, international institutions across the world. And now I think it's the time to give the floor to Professor Nio. And, um, and please, over to you. We are very eager to <laughs> and excited um, to host you and listen to you today. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Metavi, for your introduction. It is a great honor for me to be making this presentation today on my work on antimicrobial surfaces. So now let me share my screen with you and I'll start the presentation. Okay, so antimicrobial surfaces is one of the three areas that I focus on. The other two meaning uh, being tissue engineering and nanoparticles for cancer theranostics. All these three areas pertain to biomedical uh, engineering. So I'm very fortunate really to have uh, collaborators from various disciplines that helped me tremendously in my research. Now, one of the reasons why I'm so interested in antimicrobial surfaces is the problem of biofilms and the healthcare associated infections. So when a Biomaterial is introduced into the body, there's a tendency for bacteria to adhere to the surface and to form a biofilm. And the biofilm, once it is formed, is very hard to eradicate. So it is really not surprising that more than 65% of microbial infections are associated with biofilm formation. And the reason why this biofilm bacteria is so hard to eradicate is because the uh, polysaccharide matrix itself of the biofilm is like a barrier. And also this bacteria has changed from the free floating form. So their metabolism is lower and so they don't take in a lot of the antimicrobial agents. 
So the formation of biofilm or medical devices such as catheters will increase the risk of healthcare associated infections. And CDC statistics showed that one in 31 US patients while receiving care in a hospital in the end ended up with at least one HAI. And obviously the HAIs will increase treatment costs and also mortality of the patients. So our aim is to try to develop antimicrobial surfaces and we are targeting certain potential applications. Uh, there are four of them I listed here, urinary catheters, peritoneal dialysis catheters and blood contacting surfaces, orthopedic implants, transparent coatings for medical equipment in healthcare settings. Some of these are more developed than the others and I'll present all four. I'll also say a few words about challenges that we foresee in trying to translate whatever we get in the lab to potential applications. Safety and efficacy in the targeted environment is obviously one of them. But the other factor that is important is also the economic and technical visibility of the scale up process. So when we put on an antimicrobial surface, its purpose is really to inhibit microbial colonization. And in this case, prevention is really better than cure because we know how difficult it is to eradicate biofilm when it is formed. So antimicrobial surfaces usually rely on two mechanisms. One is to prevent the bacteria from adhering and forming the biofilm, and the other one is to kill the bacteria. But in our consideration, we think that the combination of both mechanisms in one surface coating is the best. There are a number of factors that we need to take into consideration when we design the coating. One is what's the duration of application? If we are going for an eluting agent, then we know that there's only a limited amount of agent that can be incorporated onto a thin surface coating. So long-term application would be very difficult. The other important effect is what happens to the non-target tissue and cells in the surrounding. We know that there are some polymers, cationic polymers, that are good to kill bacteria by breaking down or depolarizing their cell membrane. But unfortunately, these kind of polymers will activate platelets they will promote thrombus formation. And then we need also to consider bacterial burden. If the bacterial burden is high and we're killing the bacteria, there is a possibility of bacterial dead bacteria built up on the surface if the surface is not anti-fouling. So let me start with the first application on urinary catheters. Urinary catheters is one of the most widely used medical devices and millions of them are used worldwide annually. Unfortunately, they are associated with infections. And this catheter-associated urinary tract infections are called cortis in short. And the rates of infection in patients undergoing catheterization can range from 10% if the period of catheterization is short to almost 100% or virtually 100% for those undergoing long-term catheterization. And the reason is because if you look at the figure, the catheter itself form a route for bacteria to go into the urinary tract. And its surface gives the platform for bacteria to form the biofilm. So the most prevalent causative agent of CORTI is uropathogenic E. coli. But there is also another major complication for patients undergoing long-term catheterization, and that is encrustation. Encrustation is due to certain bacteria producing the enzyme urease. So we can see in this reaction over here, Urease catalyzes the hydrolysis of urea in the urine to CO2 and ammonia. And this causes the pH to rise and calcium and magnesium salts will precipitate out from the urine. And this will cause blockage of the urinary catheter and urine cannot flow and this can be a very serious problem. So this is what it looks like. This is a, this brand new catheter after long-term use that can be crystalline biofilm forming the lumen as well as on the surface. And one of the most problematic bacteria that causes encrustation is Proteus mirabilis. This bacterium is very hard to handle. It can elongate from a 2 cm cell to tens of cm long, and you'll come together with other cells, join together in a raft-like form, and just swarm over the surface of the catheter. So to handle this bacteria, not only must we inhibit biofilm formation on the surface, we must also try to kill the bacteria in the vicinity of the surface so that it doesn't produce the uh, um, ammonia to increase the pH. 
This shows one of the strategies that we have used. It's a true two-pronged strategy in the sense that it will try to in prevent infec infection as well as encrustation. So what it is simply is that to build up multi-layers of silver and polydopamine. Now, the reason why we chose silver is because silver in urinary catheter is widely accepted. And dopamine is good for coating long, narrow devices like uh, catheters. So what we do is then we have multi-layers and then on the outside, we put a zwitter ionic anti-folding layer. Now this layer is very important as I'll show later on. And because the PDA is a simple process, people like to use it, but unfortunately it takes a long time at room, room conditions. So we have to accelerate this, keeping in mind that we cannot go for days. So what we do is to try to accelerate the process using oxygen and heat as well as microwave to accelerate the nanoparticles deposition. And now we are going to compare our coating with a commercial coating called the Dover silver coated catheter. So the first thing we did, of course, is just do the in vitro test. And it suffice to say that both our coating and the Dover uh, catheter perform equally well. There's not much difference. So for bacteria adhesion within, for, within four hours, the number of bacteria can be reduced by 99%. And for biofilm within 24 hours, it can be reduced by 97%. But the real test comes from encrustation. So this is the, our encrustation assay. What we did is to use tubes like this, shown in the figure. And this is artificial urine, but we spike it with the uh, P. mirabilis. So then we consider how many days before we see a precipitate like this. So this first tube is for the control. And we don't do anything. We don't put any silver catheter inside. Within one day, we will see precipitate. And the Dover catheter lasted six days. So on day seven, you can see the D for the Dover has already resulted in precipitate. Our P1, this is our coating with just one silver layer, lasted almost the same time because it's almost the same as Dover, lasted eight days. But if we just put the, the same single layer of silver with one anti-fouling layer, it prolongs its life by five more days. And we have two silver layers plus one anti-fouling layer. It lasted 45 days, which is much better than the Dover. So what went wrong with the Dover? This is a commercial catheter. So why is it not effective? Is it because it has limited amount of silver compared to our coating? So what we did is to test for silver release. So this is in sterile artificial urine. So the red squares are for the Dover <coughs> catheter. So you can see the release rate is actually the fastest in the artificial urine that's sterile without any bacteria. But once we have P. mirabilis in there, you see that the silver release from the Dover is actually now much less. And in fact, after five days, you can see that the rate has slowed down so much it is not surprising that encrustation will occur because the silver is actually not being released. And why is the silver not being released? We think it's because the Dover catheter doesn't have this anti-fouling layer on top. So a lot of foulants collect on the surface, which impeded the release of the silver to kill the bacteria in the urine. And it is not a matter of having not enough silver because when we check, only 14% of the silver in Dover was released before encrustation occurs. So there's plenty of silver left. So we tried to uh, confirm by looking at SEM and EDEX of the coating. So the first row shows the cross section of the coating before the assay. So the Dover catheter has a thinner coating than ours. And the second, third, and fourth row will be after the assay. First two columns for Dover and P2 for seven days Last column for P3, which is our best performer, is 40 days. So you can see that after seven days, we can't even see the coating anymore because it's totally encrusted. And you can see from the top surface, lots of crystals around. If we check EDEX, the silicon signal from the substrate, because we're using silicon catheter, is, has diminished so small. And in place, we start to see calcium and magnesium. Now we compare the P2, after seven days, we can still see the coating. The surface is not as uh, crowded with uh, crystals as the uh, Dover. You can still see a very strong silicon signal. 
you see some calcium, but you can still see a strong silicon signal. That means the substrate is still showing. And this is P3 after 40 days. And you can again see that we have very strong silicon signal compared to the Dover case after only seven days. So we think that this P3 coating is actually quite good. So we decided to do animal tests. So initially we tried mice because it's cheap. So the way we did it is to introduce a small piece of this coated catheter into the bladder of the mice. And then we instill bacteria inside. Every day we will monitor the urine of the mice. And then after that, we'll sacrifice the mice following 14 days of monitoring. So this is the result with E. coli. So this is the bacteria count in urine. So the uncoated catheter, you can see, has a higher bacterial burden in the urine compared to the P3. And this one is interleukin-6 marker. This is the indication of inflammation. So you can see again that the uncoated catheter gives rise to more inflammation than the P3 coating. And we didn't detect any toxicity issues because the kidney functions were normal and the uh, weight profiles were not affected. But we know that this experiment has certain limitations because the way the uh, catheter is being introduced, this is very different from how a urinary catheter is being used. And also we cannot compare with any commercial silver coated catheter because they don't make them so small. And we did try with P. mirabilis, but it's a bad idea because the mortality rate is very high when we introduce this bacteria into the bladder itself. So we decided that we will go on to the pig model where we can use the full length catheter like in the human. So in this, this time we can compare the P3 now with the Dover. And we do not introduce the bacteria into the bladder because we know what's going to happen. So we introduce it on the catheter surface at the exit. And this is how urinary get, catheter gets infected. And then we evaluate what happens after a certain number of time. So this shows the result with E. coli. Uh, these are very preliminary results because we didn't have many pigs. This is the uh, bacterial loading on tissues. So this is bladder, urethra, and kidneys. So in all three types of tissues, we see a higher loading of bacteria for the Dover catheter. But what is most interesting is here, we see that these are certain locations of the Dover catheter. We check each location. And at certain locations, we can already see blockage after 21 days. On the other hand, the P3 catheter, the lumen is fully open. And we check what is in these deposits. We see calcium, we see magnesium. But we know that the real test is actually P. mirabilis. So we did that also. As I said earlier, this bacteria is very hard to handle. It causes a high mortality rate and so on. And in this case, for the Dover, the catheter is completely blocked after 14 days. So it's not possible to continue the experiment anymore. So you can see from here, the, the uh, microscopy images, you can see the crystals have completely filled up the uh, lumen. And this is what it looks like on the microscope. You can see the crystalline structure. And we try to compare the bacterial count but we couldn't because the bacteria that's embedded in these crystalline biofilms is very hard to dislodge using our method of uh, sonication and so on. If you compare the P3, there are some deposits we see that, but definitely the lumen remains open much more than the Dover catheter. So our preliminary findings, we can conclude that the P3 looks like it's more effective than the Dover catheter in inhibiting biofilm formation as well as encrustation. And there are no systemic signs to suggest that this coating will cause cytotoxicity to the animal. So now let me move on to another type of catheter. This is the peritoneal dialysis catheter. Now peritoneal dialysis is a home-based dialysis method used for patients with uh, kidney failure. So what happens is that for these patients, there's a long catheter that's inserted into the peritoneal cavity. And on a daily basis, dialysis solution will be passed in, through the catheter into the cavity, dwell for a certain period of time, and then drain out. And when it's drained out, you remove some of the waste that the body has produced. There are two major complications associated with this type of uh, catheter. One, again, is bacterial infection because of the migration into the uh, cavity. But the other one is omental wrapping. Now, omental wrapping arises because there's a tissue in our body called omentum. And this omentum likes to stick on to foreign objects. So when it sees a catheter, it will 
stick onto it and block the holes of the catheter and the dialysis solution can no longer drain. Now, because this catheter has to be in the patient for life, we need to have something that's long lasting and anti-adhesive to stop the momentum from wrapping. So we decided to explore agarose, which is a polysaccharide. So the way we did it is to first introduce acrylate groups onto our agarose. And then again, we are using silicone as a substrate because that's what the peritoneal dialysis catheter is made of. Then we can introduce this uh, function, uh, reactive groups on the surface of silicone by either using oxygen plasma or ozone. And then for using these surface reactive groups, we are going to graph the uh, acrylated agarose onto them using either heat or UV. So this shows the coating. This is a flat sheet, and this is a inner part, uh, the, the intraluminal surface of a tubing. Both cases, we coat two micron. The flat sheet, we use a plasma and we use UV. For the tubing, we use ozone and we use heat. So both this can be done, as we can see here, both, in both cases, two micron coatings can be obtained. This shows the results. This coating turns out to be quite effective in reducing bacteria biofilm formation by 99%. As you can see, this is pristine silicone after 48 hours, it's full of biofilm. And after coating, the amount of bacteria on the surface is much reduced. It also reduces mammalian cell adhesion. This is fibroblast and uh, protein adsorption also by about 90%. Because this peritoneal dialysis catheter is very long, it's about 55 cm long, we have to make sure that it is uniformly coated. So what we did is to take the coating and cut out three random pieces along its length and carry out the antimicrobial assay to see what's the error bar that we will get. So this light blue bar, the first one here is for the pristine catheter. So we have a uh, high bacterial load. And this is the one that's been coated with agarose. So we have about uh, two orders of magnitude reduction. And you can see from the size of the error bar that it's not big. So that means the coating is probably uniform. And the other thing we need to test is how stable is this coating. So we stick it into the autoclave before the antimicrobial assay and then carry out the antimicrobial assay. So we find this is the, the, the one, the second bar, the, the one with the slanting lines is after autoclaving. There's no significant difference between before autoclaving and after autoclaving. That means the catheter, the catheter coating is stable. So we, again, we want to proceed to animal model. And here we had a problem because we don't know what animal to use and there's very few studies on uh, PD catheter failure. So initially we tried a rat, but the rat we found that it's not quite suitable because they don't have much momentum tissue. So there's no momentum wrapping whether the catheter is modified or not. Then we move on to the pigs. The pigs proved to be suitable and omental wrapping was observed after 40 days, uh, 20 days. So you can see this is what omentum wrapping looks like. You can see this is a catheter here. And it's completely wrapped up by this tissue, which is the omentum, and it sticks to the stomach, sticks to the uh, abdominal wall. So now when we want to carry out our experiment, we take one pig and implant with two catheters, a uncoated catheter, and a agarose coated catheter. And then every day we'll flush the catheters with PD fluid, uh, which is what patients would do. And then we monitor the pigs. And then at the end of the experiment, which is 28 days, we'll take a look at the catheter. So we managed to test out eight pigs. And this is what it looks like. The, this is the dialysis fluid here. And it is just put into the pig by gravity, gravitational flow. And the catheter is inserted into the pig. So what we did after the uh, the period of experiments over is to compare the amount of mental wrapping. And this is just a qualitative assessment. We find that five out of the, out of the eight pigs, the uncoated catheter show a higher extent of mental wrapping. One pig is about the same. And for two pigs, the uncoated catheter has much has less mental wrapping than the agarose coated catheter. And not only do we assess the extent of wrapping, we also assess the extent of adhesion and what we found is that in this case, for example, this is the coated catheter. The tissue is not really adhered very strongly. It's, it's actually quite mobile. It can slip off easily. Or in the case of the coated catheter, it sticks very well and it cannot be removed. And although we didn't introduce any bacteria, we also checked for bacteria and we find that the, the bacteria burden on this uncoated catheter is much more than on the coated catheter. 
And the presence of bacteria is not surprising because this pig really stays in a very unhygienic place. It, it will just lie around near its droppings and so on. So bacteria migrating into the catheter is not surprising. So our preliminary conclusion is that the acarose coating looks that it's, it's possible to reduce both bacteria and omental adhesion on catheters. But we know that this experiment really has some limitation. One is the lack of sterility. We know that patients will try to keep their catheters clean, not, not like what we see in the pigs. And then also a problem of catheter displacement, meaning that we cannot leave the catheter in there for too long because the pigs get very irritated with the catheters in there and will do everything to try to get rid of them. So the period of testing is actually only 28 days. Now let me move on to blood contacting surfaces. Uh, examples of blood contacting surfaces would be intravascular, stents, catheters, extracorporeal life support systems. And it, again, infections is one of the main problem. But another problem is thrombosis, the forming of blood clots. So to render this catheter surface less thrombogenic, we will need to inhibit protein adsorption, platelet adhesion, platelet activation. So since we already have the agarose coating, we asked whether it is possible to use this for blood contacting devices because we know that the agarose coating can inhibit bacterial adhesion, it can inhibit protein adsorption. Would it be suitable then for the thrombus, inhibiting thrombus formation? So this is our data with platelets. So again, the top surface here, the top image here is the silicone surface and you can see platelets adhering. And this is after the agarose coating. It looks good in the sense that it reduces the number of platelets very significantly. But if we look very closely at the platelets, we see the presence of pseudopodia. That means these platelets are still activated. So this will not do for blood contacting surface. So what we did then was to immobilize heparin onto our agarose coating. So when we do the coating, it's a co-immobilization process. And now we look at the uh, uh, platelet, we do not see any activation. So this, this is good, much better than just the agarose coating. But we have to be careful in how much heparin we use, because if we put too much heparin, then the bacteria adhesion would not be as good as on just the agarose surface, as you can see from this plot here. And we are continuing this work, but we are trying not to use heparin now. We are moving on to an anti-coagulant uh, peptide. I don't have the, all the results yet, so I'm not presenting it now. Now, in the previous method, the agarose coating looks pretty good. So we are quite excited about this uh, coating. The only problem is that the coating process requires oxygen-free environment. And we know that this is going to be a complication when it comes to industrial scale up for manufacturing. So we are looking around for a method that we can use that is tolerant of oxygen. So then we decided to try this tile all method. This tile all method is a reaction of OH with tile groups under UV. And it can be carried out at room conditions. So here we again have the substrate where we introduce uh, surface reactive groups using plasma. And then we need a linker. And this linker is dimercaparol. Dimercaparol is shown here. It has two tile groups and one OH group. It is an FDA approved agent or treating heavy metal poisoning. So it's a good thing to use. So what we do is now to use dimercaparol to react the surface group. So the, the, the tile group will react with the OH surface groups and the remaining tile all will be used to react with the OH of the agarose. And agarose have lots of OH, so that's no, not a problem. And then further reaction with dimercaparol and agarose will give us a cross link coating. We find that this tire all method gives a thinner coating using the same period of time as our earlier grafting method in the absence of oxygen. For polyurethane films and titanium, this is not an issue. We get similar high efficacy in biofilm reduction, as you can see over here. And the coating is also highly stable. The coating is non-toxic, but it is less successful for silicone. And we think the reason is because of hydrophobic recovery. The silicone chains are quite mobile. So if the coating is not cross-linked enough or is too thin, then the uh, hydrophobic chains can migrate back up to the surface. So while this tire all method is promising, uh, we need to improve it more for silicon, which is a very important biomaterial. Let me now move on to the third area of uh, applications. This is orthopedic implants. So when such implants are placed in the body, 
the race for its surface occurs. And this race is between bacteria and bone cells. So we can imagine that if bacteria wins this race, what happens? So if bacteria wins the race, it'll colonize the surface, form a biofilm, and then increases the risk of infection because this osteoblast will not be able to displace the bacteria that's already on the surface. So we really want the osteoblast to win because if the osteoblast doesn't colonize the surface, there's going to be no integration with the natural bone and the implant fails. So we need to ensure that the coating that we put on this implant surface or whatever treatment we do to the implant surface, it can address both problems simultaneously. The problem of bacteria, adhesion and infection, and the issue of osseointegration. So the, the period after implantation, the first six hours is deemed a decisive period because this is the period when the implant is particularly susceptible to bacteria colonization. And we've seen from our previous data that, oh, we can just put an anti-adhesive coating, you know, that can inhibit bacterial adhesion. But then they will also inhibit osteoblasts. So I showed the data over here for one of our coatings. So this is pristine titanium in the presence of osteoblasts. After 48 hours, osteoblasts adheres well and started to spread. And that's because titanium is a good substrate for implants. But if we coat it with hyaluronic acid, which is a polysaccharide produced by our body that can inhibit bacteria adhesion. Now we see what happens is that there's minimal attachment and spreading of the uh, osteoblasts. They remain rounded. And this, of course, will not lead to osteointegration. So in order to deal with the both problems simultaneously, we again need a two-pronged approach. So the first thing to do is to have a base polymer that takes care of the bacteria. In other words, it can be anti-adhesive, it can be bactericidal, but we need something else to take care of the osteoblast. So we need a peptide or we need a protein. And this table pretty much summarizes what we have tried. So on the left hand side here are the various antibacterial polymer. Uh, these polymers can be anti-adhesive, they can be bactericidal, they can be a mixture of both. And on this right hand side would be the factors that we have tried for osteoblast. So I'm just going to show one example. And this is an example using carboxymethylkytosan as the base layer because it has bactericidal property. And then we are going to use VEGF, which is vascular endothelial growth factor for the osteoblast. And the reason why we pick VEGF is because not only does it promote osteoblast functions, it also promotes endothelial cell function, which is important for implants. So the method of uh, changing the surface is easy. Uh, we first use dopamine to, to act as a surface linker because it has catechol group, so it sticks well to titanium. And then we graft on CMCS using carbodiimide chemistry, and then followed by the grafting of VEGF again by carbodiimide chemistry. So the results are shown here. The first row here shows the effect on bacterial colonization. So you can see this is titanium after four hours exposed to bacteria. The green dots are colonies of bacteria. So for, for titanium, not only does osteoblast adhere well, uh, unfortunately, bacteria also adhere well. But after modification with our coating, the CMCS plus VEGF, you can see that the number of bacterial colonies have greatly reduced. And then we look at what happens to the osteoblast. So this is titanium surface after six hours. So we see some spreading and attachment of the osteoblast. But compared to the modified titanium, we can see that the modified titanium, the extent of attachment and spreading is much more. And this last row is very important because this is calcium deposition. And it is the function of osteoblasts to promote calcium deposition because these are bone cells. And the brown, the brown uh, color denotes calcium deposits. So this is after 14 days. And sure enough, we have uh, calcium deposited on titanium. Uh, pristine titanium, but you can see on the modified titanium, we have much more calcium deposition. So the results does look uh, promising, but we haven't carried out any in vivo tests because for orthopedic implants, it is best to use large animals, especially sheep, but we don't have access to sheep. So, so we didn't do the in vivo work. So let me now move on to the last application that uh, we looked at, and this is for medical equipment, particularly transparent coatings for medical equipment. Now you imagine a hospital room like this, 
the furniture, the IV stands, bed rails around the patients are usually contaminated through the patient's cough, touch, and so on. And these surfaces are cleaned regularly, but unfortunately, the efficacy is really lim limited because contamination recurs rapidly or even persists, according to this article here that, that showed 27% of rooms remain contaminated with A. baumanni or MRSA following four rounds of bleach disinfection. So the problem with the contaminated surface is that patients contaminate the surface, the healthcare workers touch them, or they may take the equipment to another room, and then they pass on to other patients, and then this becomes a transmission cycle. So the question is whether if we put antibacterial coatings, can we break this transmission cycle? And the, this project that uh, I'm describing now it was actually initiated by our collaborators, the doctors in the ICU, because they want something over their um, medical equipment because people touch it and so on, the touch screens. So we zoom in on using copper because we know that copper has broad spectrum antimicrobial activity. And a number of studies have shown that in hospitals, when certain fixtures are changed to copper coated fixtures, like door handles or toilet seats and bars and so on, the microbial burden has been reduced. And we all ourselves also did some tests and we showed that copper is much more effective than silver in a dry environment like our normal rooms, hospital rooms or, or, or our house rooms. As you can see from this test, in this test is what we call the contact test. We contaminate this stud, this brown stud with bacteria, and then we press it against the surface to simulate touch. And then we see how many live bacteria was transferred over after a certain incubation time. So this is silicon surface. After 15 minutes incubation, we detected 2000 live bacteria. This is the copper coated surface, it's copper nanoparticles. And we can see a two order magnitude reduction in live bacteria. And this last column here is coated with silver nanoparticles of the same weight as the copper. And you can see that there's no significant difference between a silver nanoparticle coated surface and the uncoated surface within 15 minutes of incubation. So we know that copper will be a good thing to try, but because the, uh, the request is for coatings over the instrument, we cannot use elemental copper like this because then you, they wouldn't be able to see the readings. So then we decided to use copper ions. So how do we then get the copper ions to stick to the surface of polymer sheets. So the first method we tried was, okay, we'll use certain polymers that have functional groups that, oh, that the copper ions can interact with, like NH2 groups, OH group, and so on. So we have chitosan, we have polydopamine, and we have EDTA that we can put on top of the chitosan coating. But the amount of loading of copper ions would be expected to be low because the coating is thin and there's only a limited amount of functional groups for interaction. So we call this the low copper loading surfaces. Then in order to increase the amount of copper loading, we decided to use silica nanoparticles because the silica nanoparticles can act as nano reservoirs for loading our copper ions. So we call this the high copper loading surfaces. <clears throat> so this is uh, the low copper loading surfaces. A number of them is a little bit messy. The top rug over here is just to show polydopamine, that's all. So polydopamine on the surface is easily made. You just uh, treat it with a copper salt solution and the copper ions would be interacting with the various functional groups. The bottom route here shows the grafting first of accumulated quaternized chitosan. And then we use uh, the groups of this quaternized chitosan to react with EDTA. And then we have additional functional, functional groups that we can increase the copper interaction. So you can see that we can increase copper interaction by using EDTA on top of the quaternized chitosan. So let me just uh, show the results of one of them, which is the chitosan EDTA copper coating. And this coating can be put on polymers, it can be put on uh, metals, and the amount of uh, copper that's loaded can be varied. And depending on the amount of copper, the bactericidal property can be maintained after 100 wipes with a piece of cloth that's wetted with water. If the concentration is too low, then we will lose the bactericidal property. But if it is maintained at, at a certain level, then we can preserve the bactericidal property. 
So here we are doing a simulated cough droplet test. We put a one micro liter of uh, droplet containing bacteria onto the surface, and we detect how many viable bacteria remain after 60 minutes. PVF is polyvinyl fluoride. We are using that as our substrate because it's very clear. It's a very nice clear plastic. And this is the uh, PVF we are coating. So depending on the type of uh, bacteria, it can be used by one to two orders of magnitude. And what is nice about this coating is that it's transparent. So we can see the color patterns here. Let's just forget about this one. Let's just look at this four. This one has no film put that's on top. This one has a PVS film, but because PVS is so clear, you cannot even see the film. And then this one's coated with chitosan copper, which is lower uh, copper loading. And this is coated with, uh, this is a, there's a piece of uh, PVF over it that's coated with chitosan, EDTA, copper. So these are uh, higher than this other one, the loading. And in all cases, if you look at it visually, it's hard to see the difference. But we did run the uh, transmission spectrum and we find that this coating, the chitosan, EDTA, copper coating, the transmission is 75% of the PVF coating. And this is much better than this one, which is polydopamine copper. It is very easy to make, but unfortunately, polydopamine has a brownish tint. So you, you will give a brownish tint to the coating. And then we try it out. We put it over our syringe pump. We can see the readings pretty well, and the touch functionality was also preserved. But we want to try to do something with a high copper loading so they can last longer. So the first step is the same. We graph quaternized chitosan on a PBF, and then instead of conjugating EDTA, we grow silica nanoparticles on the chitosan coating using the Stobus process. After this is done, we put on another layer of quaternized chitosan to form this sandwich structure. And this gives it stability through, intro, through electrostatic interactions because quaternized chitosan is positively charged, the silica nanoparticles are negatively charged. So depending on how long we um, built up the silica layer, we can change the copper concentration. Then now we want to assess the stability after wiping again with the water wetted cloth 100 times. So here we show one set of data. So after wiping 100 times, the silica concentration decreased by 14%. The copper concentration decreased by 40%. But as you can see over here, before and after wiping, the antibacterial efficacy using the droplet test remained unchanged. That's because there's sufficient copper inside here to compensate for what is lost with the wiping. And we carry out the contact test. In other words, again, using contaminated start, the efficacy is even better. Within 60 minutes, we cannot find any viable bacteria left on the surface. And these are all just three different configurations and loading of copper. And even with such high efficacy against bacteria, the good thing is that it's not cytotoxic to human dermal fibroblasts. So you can see that it's about 100% viability in all cases. And this shows, again, that this is very clear, that the coatings are very clear. And when we measure the transmission, it's about 70 to 97%, depending on the wavelength. This is over the visible region with respect to the original PVF. So the last part, I'm just going to say a few words about what we foresee as challenges in translating success from lab to the clinic. We know that many promising innovations did not translate to clinical outcomes or failed to be commercialized. And there are a couple of reasons. One is because of the inability of our lab tests to mimic the actual conditions. For example, the period of testing. We tested, for us, when we tested 30 days, we think that it is pretty long. But then for the peritoneal dialysis catheter, it needs to be in there for a long time, for life. So maybe whatever efficacy we get might not be representative, maybe a year, in a year's time. But for certain applications, it might be OK. And then we cannot simulate complex and dynamic molecular processes in the body in the lab. And then the scale up is also an issue because we tend to use mice. We need that rats, rabbits. So here we use small pieces of the uh, device rather than the actual device itself, like the long catheter. And that, then when we want to go on and translate and scale up, the coating process can be very difficult, difficult because now we have a long narrow tube, for example, for catheters. Is it stable? Is it uniform inside expression? Especially the intraluminal surface is very tricky. And then the complexity and time requirement of the coating process. Um, I talk about oxygen-free environment. Ma many of our grafting process needs oxygen-free environment and that introduces complications. 
And sometimes we need multi-step process, and that also is not viewed very favorably by the industry because it is again complicated. So let me just very quickly share the case of urinary catheters. This urinary catheter design, the Foley catheter, was actually designed in 1929 and has re remained largely unchanged since. It is such an integral part of medical care, but we know it is responsible for infections, blockages, and so on. So there was a very interesting question asked in the editorial of New England Journal of Medicine in 1988. The author asked, can we build a better urinary catheter? Obviously, a lot of people have tried, but the results are quite disappointing. I give two examples. The first one is about commercial catheters. So there are two types of catheters that were tested in clinical trials. One is a silver alloy catheter, and the other one is nitrofurazone catheter. This is a um, antimicrobial agent. And both of them showed disappointing results. We can still buy the silver alloy catheter, but as you can see from the Dover, it doesn't perform very well. But the nitrofurazone coated catheters are no longer marketed. More recently, there's this chocolate micro pattern catheters. From lab experiments, it was found that bacteria, certain bacteria, cannot adhere and colonize patterns like this well. So they decided to use it for catheters. But when they did it in the uh, first in man open label randomized control trial, again, they find that the uh, incidence of infections were not reduced. So again, a disappointing results. So let me come to the end of my uh, presentation. I'm just going to say that you know, there are plenty of opportunities for antimicrobial coatings because it's a multi-billion dollar industry spanning consumer goods, food packaging, healthcare products, and so on. But particularly for healthcare, when we design an antimicrobial surface, we have to start thinking about a specific application right from the beginning because the requirements on the surface, for example, for uh, orthopedic implants versus peritoneal dialysis catheter versus urinary catheter, they're all very different. So in this aspect, it's good to have close collaboration with the clinicians because they are the ones who can educate us better. What are the requirements besides the antimicrobial property for any device? And they're also more aware of the multifactorial variables that occur in the human body. And also I find that uh, with an industrial collaborator at the early stage of the project, it's also good because they feedback certain things that we don't think about in the lab. So I've really come to the end of my presentation. I'd like to acknowledge the funding agencies that have funded our work so far and my collaborators, especially those from the medical school and from the industry and all the PhD students and research staff who have worked on my projects. And of course, I thank all of you for coming to my presentation. Thank you. So if there are any questions, I'll be happy to, uh, to answer them. Thank you very much for the very inspiring presentation, KG. And um, so, uh, questions. Oh yeah, somebody says yes. I have some questions. Uh, yeah, I think um, we you can. Uh, okay, here we got a, we got a question. When we talk about resistance here, we mean that bacteria are less sensitive to antibiotics because of biofilms, right? But bacteria can develop natural or innate resistance to antibiotics due to genetic mutation or inner structural changes inside the cells. Can the antimicrobial surfaces tackle the antimicrobial resistance caused by genetic mutations? Okay, yes, I understand the question. Yes, we have tried it with the uh, urinary catheter, the mm -hmm. one that I showed, the multi-layer one. I can't remember which, I think we tried with E. coli. I don't think we tried with P. mirabilis. And it seems okay that, uh, I think that the reason is because that silver, the, the antimicrobial mechanism of silver is doing something about the cell membrane. So it's harder to, re, to develop resistance than something that's taken into the, the, the bacteria, inside the bacteria. So we did try, I think, uh, three or four rounds and we didn't see increase in, uh, in uh, resistance. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And um, there's another question. How does plasma oxidation is uh, achieved on long narrow substrate as catheters? Okay, so for long narrow substrates, we tend to use uh, ozone. Because mm -hmm. I showed the, the, the peritoneal dialysis catheter, 
So the flat sheets, we use plasma. The long, narrow one, we pass ozone through it. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. There's one more question. Oh, a few more. Um, so first question is, can you introduce the method you use to quantitatively test the antimicrobial ability of antimicrobial surface? Do you stain the bacteria with dyes or do you observe them directly with the scan electron microscope? Have you ever heard of the single molecule microarray? Okay, what we did was to count the bacteria because we report as CFU. So of course we use the scanning electron microscope as a qualitative means of knowing that, oh yes, this looks good, but we actually do the count itself. I have not heard of that single uh, what molecule? Molecule uh, microarray. No, I haven't done that. Okay. Um, then we have another question. You tested how robust your cytosan copper surface, surface treatment is by wiping it 100 times. Does it also degrade over time without wiping or is it stable while adhered? How long is the surface treatment stable for? Okay. Uh, for those kind of surfaces, the copper is copper ions. It's not copper nanoparticles. So the copper ions will just interact with the uh, functional groups. So the, I think the, the, the biggest fear is water, actually. So that's why we try the water wetted surface. Because if it's water, the, the uh, uh, copper ions can diffuse out. But even the normal room condition, it is OK. We have tested it for over a few days. It, it, it's no problem with friction or anything, but once there's water, I think that is the problem. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Oh, yeah, yeah. Ah, sorry, <laughs> scrolling down. Again, we have some, um, yeah, the another question from UK. She, uh, in your work, you have used polymers as the antimicrobial surfaces. As for antimicrobial surfaces used in the clinical environment, is it acceptable to use some materials like semiconductor, which can produce superoxides under the visible light illumination? Superoxides is an effective antimicrobial substance, and it seems that bacteria has less little resistance towards superoxide. Yes, I think for that kind of method, it's best for environmental contamination. In other words, rooms, furnitures, and so on. But for in vivo, that means coating on the catheter that has to go into the people, uh, the doctors are very worried. That's why we always have to use something that, you know, they, they think like agarose or something. You know, even though we have some better polymers, more, I would say, uh, not as natural. In other words, uh, man-made kind of uh, coatings. they rather not have it. they rather have things like agarose, hyaluronic acids, you know, things like that. So I think for those semiconductor things, it'll be very good for environmental contamination like in hospital rooms, furnitures, and so on. Thank you. And um, we have another question uh, from Ross. So for orthopedic implants, during the six hour race between osteoblast and bacteria, is there a way to accelerate osteoblast formation? For instance, increasing osteoblast via pluripotent stem cell production? I guess it's possible, but I just don't know how it would be done you know, in the, in the actual case, like say when a, 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 a doctor is putting in the implants, does he introduce the stem cells at that point? Or does he grow it on the, the implant first and then put it in? Because, you know, these are the, the, the things that I'm, I'm not clear how it could be done. I'm sure it can be accelerated using stem cells, but I'm just not sure that clinically how it can be done. Mm -hmm. I have two more questions, another one from UK. Do uh, shark-like shark, shark yeah. <laughs> surfaces uh, have disappointing result inside people's body? Yes, it seems that on the, in the in vitro results it looks good, but don't know what happened in the uh, in the clinical trials that it didn't help at all. 
may you know I'm just speculating, but maybe it's because some protein may adhere on the surface, so that the chocolate structure is lost in the sense that you know the the, the bacteria doesn't see the the chocolate topography anymore. It's actually seeing a layer of protein from body, from the body fluids or something. It could be I I don't know, but it seems that the results are disappointing. Mm -hmm. I see. Thank you. And then from Yoram, we have actually bacteria have good ways to resist superoxide. Um, for instance, via SODs. More like a comment, seems like. Yes, I think it's a comment. I don't work on superoxide, so but yeah. I, I thought so that you know, have back and forth between UK and Yoram. Actually, I have a question. <laughs> so yeah. I. Um, I was wondering, what, do you, what is your view about the so claim uh, antimicrobial properties of 2D materials, in particular graphene oxide? Yes, we have done that also. I didn't yeah. present the work. But one of the problems with graphene is sometimes because, you know, the, the graphene plates or uh, what, the sheets, whatever you call it, they are quite sharp. So they, they, they kill the bacteria, right? They, they're supposed yeah. to antimicrobial resist the problem. They can kill the bacteria. That's good. But we also find that sometimes it kills the cells. Um, I see. So, so that was our concern. Really yes, we, we see, we do see definitely that they can kill bacteria. In fact, we tried once to coat it on the uh, our urinary catheter. Yeah. Uh, try to combine, you know, that the urinary catheter that I showed, the multi silver layer, we coat graphene on the outside. And definitely coating the graphene on the outside is, is good in the sense that the uh, it kills the bacteria. It doesn't form biofilm as easy. But then on the other hand, it interferes with the silver release. So then we have problem of encrustation. So, I mean, we didn't optimize it, but this is what we noticed that graphene is good to kill bacteria, but one, it affected our silver release and two, there's some cytotoxicity effects on our cells. And, and do you think it's more to do with the sharp edges or the functional groups that are there, like the, other, the negatively charged functional groups? It could be both because, yeah, I think it could be both, but you know, people have been talking about why graphene is so effective is because it is flat and then it's, it's sharp, you know, things like that. So, yeah. but I think definitely that, that the functional groups will have an effect. And also, we're not sure, but you know, whether it produces some kind of material, catalyze some kind of material on its surface or some reactions, we don't know. Yeah, yeah, so I see. So you think it might be more suitable for uh, external surfaces and not for such a like delicate invasive um, uh, tools that you 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 study basically. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of opportunities for mm -hmm. external applications. It's much simpler, much much simpler than for in vivo applications. Okay. Because there's so many constraints. You know, doctors don't like this. They don't like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. those are many things to study. Like if there are side reactions induced by. Right. <laughs> Graphene <laughs> just yeah, complicating your life more. <laughs> okay, so let's see if there are any more questions. Okay, we have another two questions, and then I think we have to close because we are fifty nine. So uh, from Luca has been tested that pattern surface can direct osteoblast adhesion and growth. Do you see combining patterning and coating a viable route to enhance antimicrobial properties and growth rate of bone cells? Yes, we have done some work on this, but the problem is that the size of the patterns are different from, from osteoblasts and bacteria. So what, whatever is good for the osteoblast may not be good for the bacteria. So we have tried that. We have tried to make micro patterns on, on surfaces. Okay. Great, thank you um, everyone. And uh, well, thank you first, uh, Professor KG Neo uh, for, for your time and the uh, beautiful presentation that has been really inspiring to many of us. And I think our time is up now. We are sharp at 11. <laughs> so <laughs> we need to say goodbye to everyone and thank you everyone for, for, for attending and for the attention and, uh, and yeah. Thank you again a lot, Professor Neo. It was very really exciting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, your, for, for, for joining me.